Sefer Devarim, Parshat Nitzavim, on the inclusiveness of Torah. Parshat Nitzavim begins with Moses saying, you stand this day, all of you, before the Lord your God. And by all of you, Moshe meant everyone, your tribal heads, your elders, and your officials, every householder in Israel, your children, your wives, even the stranger within your camp, from woodchopper to woodrawer. This is significant because Moshe's goal in this parsha is to persuade everyone to live according to Torah. He later tells them in one of Deuteronomy's most famous passages, Surely this instruction which I enjoin upon you this day is not too baffling for you, nor is it beyond reach. It is not in the heavens that you should say, who among us can go up to the heavens and get it for us and impart it to us that we may observe it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who among us can cross to the other side of the sea and get it for us and impart it to us that we may observe it. No, the thing is very close to you, in your mouth and in your heart, to observe it. Friends, here we learn that Torah life and learning is not some elite endeavor to be kept away from the people, but a necessary and accessible activity for all of the people. The Torah is not hidden and it's not far away, even when exclusion from the institutional Jewish world can make it feel that way. The nearness of the Torah democratizes Jewish life, even by taking power away from the rabbis. About 500 years ago, Ovadia Sforno commented, it is not beyond your reach, velo rechokahi that you have to ask the leading Torah scholars of your generation who live a long way from you to explain how to observe this commandment. You can easily observe this commandment even in the diaspora where you may not have any Torah scholars nearby. Jews without access to formal Jewish learning experiences can still access the Torah from their own place. Better yet, Jewish educators and institutions should strategize on how to best reach them to provide them an even richer experience. If we take the Torah's ethic of inclusivity to heart, we can see how pressing the problem of exclusivity in the Jewish world is. Yes, there is a value to putting fences around the Torah, protecting what we cherish, but that means taking good care of the Torah so that it can live and thrive among us, not hiding it from the people and turning it into a dead relic. The thing that's most cherished to us needs to be made available. Primarily, this means providing education opportunities for all people. As we have learned, Torah is for the leaders and the laborers, men and women, the old and the young, the familiar faces and the strangers. For Torah educators, our task is to maintain the authenticity and depth while also lowering the barriers to entry. And like keeping the commandments of the Torah, accomplishing this is not at all out of reach. Outside of the Jewish world, we can use the Torah's teaching to recognize that the great moral debates in society today cannot be reserved for elite philosophers, powerful politicians, and wealthy business people. And while the masses are left without access to wisdom, merely as pawns for partisan bandwagoning, as a culture, we need to reinvigorate a robust system of moral education that is deep and challenging, but digestible by the masses. Just as we teach math, English, and science in schools, so too should we engage in activities fostering moral reasoning and cultivating empathy. We must reawaken a moral discourse beyond Twitter shouting. The famous Talmud story of the oven of Achnai, Tanur Shel Achnai, comes to mind. In Tractate Bava Metzia, a voice from heaven tells this rabbi's 
God's opinion on the ritual purity of the oven. Rav Yehoshua, it says, stands up and quotes back one of the verses we examined today. Lo b'shemayim he, it's not in heaven. God's response, God smiles and says, my children have triumphed over me. My, ch my children have triumphed over me. We now live in an era where we're more informed by the consensus of the people than clear instructions from God. To rebuild democracy to its best form, we first need to rebuild a healthy moral discourse. One of the ways to also get there is through a year or two of mandatory service between high school and college, which would provide hands-on experience and learning about pressing moral issues. But also for adults, we have to reawaken a civic engagement and civic learning process that we need a fourth space in society beyond the three dominant ones of market, government, and home. For many, that fourth space will be sports or religion, but we need a space where we rebuild society through moral dialogue. This is a rejection of both libertarianism and authoritarianism. It is neither all about the individual nor all about the collective. We must hold both the rights and dignity of the individual and the collective utilitarian good, rejecting the crudest forms of capitalism and communism. Religion should be a part of the solution rather than an inhibitor, fostering moral discourse rather than fundamentalist ideology. Similarly, in the specifically religious realm, we are so far removed from the era of Moses that our understanding of the Torah requires layers upon layers of interpretation. This might at first glance feel like a violation of the Torah's sanctity, However, the Kedushat Levi, an 18th and 19th century Hasidic master, explained it like this. When a child wins a game of chess against their parent for the first time, the parent derives great satisfaction of having taught their child so well. Similarly, if during a discussion on the meaning of a certain verse in the Torah, the child, i.e. one of the Torah scholars, has shown outstanding skill and understanding of the Torah's deeper meaning, the author, God, derives great satisfaction from this. I love that, Kedushet lady. The largest group that has so often been excluded from this process against Torah values, I would argue, is women. Professor Tamar Ross, one of my great teachers, unpacked how women need to be more included. And she unpacks this in her book, Expanding the Palace of Torah a book I highly recommend. If feminist morality is more than a passing fad, it is likely that the interpretive tradition will discover that some of the values expressed by the feminists are indeed those of the Torah and should be pursued accordingly. The fluidity of meaning that allows for this does not require that we understand that the Sinaitic revelation was incomplete. Other feminist values may be considered as opposing the values of the Torah, and as such should be rejected. Still, other, other matters may remain in the realm of the permissible, but not obligatory. Such a solution could no, be no less effective than claims to divine intervention in history, in avoiding the theological pitfall of faulting the existing biblical text. Sufficient to this task should be an underlying assumption that the multiple meanings inherent in a divine message become apparent only through a protracted process of rabbinic interpretation. Friends, whatever reason a person might feel excluded from the Torah conversation, their gender, race, sexual orientation, disability, status as a convert, wealth, or anything else, we must respond to the Torah's call to ensure that communal and societal participation must include us all. Shabbat Shalom.